All right. All right, everybody, let's get started. Uh, in this talk, we're going to be building a VR encyclopedia app using a web VR framework known as A-Frame. Um, I just want to start with a quick about me. Uh, I'm a software developer at Clearwater Analytics, um, and I have yet to find a compelling reason to apply VR to the world of accounting software, but I'm going to keep trying someday. Let me know if you have any ideas. <laughs> Um, but in my spare time, I do like to build VR apps and projects, um, so I consider myself just a hobbyist VR developer. I'm not an expert by any means, uh, so take everything I'm about to tell you and ignore it, please. Uh, like any good hobbyist, I have about a billion work in progress projects at any one time, and then like a real true hobbyist, I have nothing completed. So I definitely don't know what I'm doing, but uh, I'm going to talk about it anyway. <laughs> Okay, so in this talk, I want to start with a very quick update in terms of VR hardware changes that have happened in the past year. So I gave a talk last year, kind of an introduction to VR. This will be the changes that have happened in that past year. Uh, then we'll talk about A-Frame, which is the framework we're going to use to build our application. And then we'll go to our design of our app, as well as step-by-step -step through the implementation of the app. And then I'll save a little bit of time for any questions you guys might have. So uh, VR stands for virtual reality, if you're not familiar. The idea here is that we're trying to replace the user's experience of reality uh, with a virtual construction. This is kind of different than augmented reality, where you're trying to enhance the user's experience of reality with some virtual imagery. Um, so for VR, there's usually some common components to a VR system. There's a headset. It basically has some screens in it to give you stereoscopic vision into that VR world. Then there's some sort of tracking system. The tracking system allows the system to understand how your head and hands are moving through that VR space so that it can update the virtual representation as well. And then there's usually some kind of com controllers that are involved, and these give you what is commonly referred to as hand presence in a VR experience. Um, in terms of updates in hardware in the past year, um, for the PC VR type of systems, uh, the biggest change that's happened, these, these are the ones that plug into a PC and you're using that for all the rendering horsepower. The biggest change here have been wireless adapters that have come out. Um, that allow you to replace that cable with a transmitter that you plug into your PC and then an antenna and a battery pack that you plug into the headset. Um, these are very expensive, still at like $300. Um, that really adds up when you're talking about buying a VR system on top of one of those, but uh, that's been kind of a nice change in this area. Then, in the past year, an entirely new class of VR hardware has come out, and these are standalone VR headsets. So the one that released in the past year was the Oculus Go, and these are fully self-contained VR headsets. So they have a battery, a processor, a screen, all built in. You just pop it on your head, and you're good to go. Um, they're kind of limited. So the Oculus Go just has rotation tracking for your head alone. So you can't move it through space, but it will track the rotation. And they have pretty limited controller support. So it just has one rotationally tracked controller. Uh, but just last month, Oculus announced their next product, which is the Oculus Quest. And it's pictured here. Um, this is a standalone headset that has full tracking, so it has full position rotation tracking for the headset as well as two fully tracked controllers. What's exciting about that is that really means you can build, um, it kind of reaches tracking parity with the PC VR space. Uh, this means you can build much more interesting VR apps for these standalone headsets. And that's releasing early next year. Okay, so now let's talk about software. Um, if you're not familiar, WebVR is a new JavaScript API that's been supported by most modern browsers at this point and it allows you to write JavaScript that can actually interact with VR systems that are attached to the host computer. What this means is you can build and deploy VR applications over the web, which is what we'll be doing with our project. So uh, we will not be using the WebVR API directly. Instead, we're going to be using a much higher level framework called A-Frame. Um, this is an open source framework that was originally built by Mozilla, and it's now a community-driven project. Um, it's building on top of the WebVR API, but also a technology called 3JS. And 3GS is basically a library that makes building 3D applications on the web much simpler. It kind of wraps WebGL for you. What A-Frame is adding to this mix is the ability to use HTML to actually describe and build your VR applications and scenes. Um, and that has some really interesting implications that we'll talk about in just a moment. Uh, but A-Frame also follows the entity component system pattern. And I want to talk about this pattern a little bit because it really drives how we use A-Frame. So the ECS pattern, uh, this is actually covered really well in the introductory documentation for A-Frame, but I'm going to give more of a condensed version here. Um, the whole tenet of ECS pattern is that we're trying to favor composition over inheritance. So we usually frame ECS um, in opposition to like a class hierarchy pattern. So um, there's three elements, the entity, the component, and the system. Uh, the entity, um, basically every object in your game is an entity. And the entity by itself has no behavior. It's only through adding different components to the entity that you define its behavior. So if you're making a chess game, for instance, uh, you might have an entity for the player, entity for the chessboard, and an entity for every single piece in the game. 
Um, if you're following an inheritance pattern, what you probably have is like a rook class and a pawn class, and then all those objects would be instances of those classes. Whereas in ECS, um, every single piece in your game board is just an entity, but then we add different components to those entities to get their desired behavior. So the component is really the meat of the pattern. Every component is responsible for a very specific type of behavior or functionality. Uh, so for example, you might have a position component whose only responsibility is describing the position of an entity, or a material component whose only responsibility is defining the surface material or the color of the, of the entity. And then finally, the system of ECS, this is for higher level component management and giving access uh, to global state for those components. A classic example of this would be a physics system. Uh, the physics system would look at all the instances of the physics components uh, and then uh, plug them into the global physics simulation. So let's take a very basic example. Let's say we had a game and we need to add a blue box to our game. Uh, so our blue box entity, um, just by creating an entity in the scene, doesn't really do anything. We need to add some behavior to it. So for our blue box, we'd say we first need a position because we want to place this blue box somewhere in the game world. Uh, and then to make it a box, we'd add a geometry component who describes the shape of our entity as being a box. And then we'd add a material component, and this would describe the box's color as being blue. Um, so we just pulled these components off of our shelf, out of our library, plugged them together to get the desired behavior for our blue box. And then kind of also important in the ECS pattern is that you want to be able to add and remove components over the lifetime of the entity to further change its behavior over time. So if we didn't want our blue box to be blue, we just remove the material component, and we could add it back in later if we wanted to. Okay, so now let's see how A-Frame uh, makes use of ECS. So as I mentioned, A-Frame, hopefully you guys can read that. Um, A-Frame uses HTML to describe the VR scenes. So this is an A-entity element. This is a custom DOM element that A-Frame provides. Uh, everything in A-Frame is prefixed with a little A dash like that. Um, so it's just an HTML entity like any other. Uh, we're adding an ID attribute, setting it to blue box. So we'll turn this entity into our blue box that we are just talking about. Uh, in the white square up here, this will be where we are. Uh, I'm going to show what the entity looks like as we keep adding components to it. So right now, it's just empty because there's no visual representation for our entity. Let's first start by adding a component for the position of our blue box. So we'd add a position component simply by adding the position attribute to our A entity DOM element. Now, just adding that position doesn't really help us. We actually want to be able to define the coordinates of its position. So to do that, we can use the attribute string. And this is what a 3D vector looks like in A-frame. It's just space delimited. This is x, y, and z coordinates, where y is the up and down axis. Um, so here we're setting the position of our blue box entity to 1 on the x, negative 2 on the y, and 3 on the z. Now again, there's still no visual representation. Um, but, so let's do that next. Let's add a geometry component. So we add another attribute to our entity called geometry. Now the geometry component takes multiple different properties. And given that we only have that attribute string to work with, A-frame follows the inline CSS style syntax, where it's key value pairs separated by semicolons. So here we're setting the primitive to box and the width and height properties to 2.0. And now we see that our blue box entity has a visual representation in our scene. So finally, we want to make it blue. So we'd add a material component, and we'd set the color property to blue. And now we've represented our blue box entity, and it has the correct behavior that we want it. Now you might be wondering, since this is HTML, you can actually um, add child entities to this thing. And that is true. You can actually nest entities within one another. Um, and this basically defines what's known as a scene graph, where our red ball is positioned relative to the blue box's position. It also inherits the rotation and the scale. All the transformations are inherited by our red ball. So when we position our red ball at 1.5 units on the y-axis, it will always be 1.5 units above our blue box. And here for our red ball, we're using the same components, just with different configurations. And that's basically the ECS pattern in A-frame. So we'll kind of be using this to build out our application. Uh, now, one interesting thing, because A-frame uses uh, HTML to build your scenes, this actually means you can use web UI frameworks to drive your VR applications. So if you've ever used Angular or React or Reagent or any of those, um, you can use them uh, to actually drive your HTML, and then your HTML representation will be uh, placed into the 3D scene by A-frame. So for instance, this top one's a React component, not to be confused with an um, A-frame component, that renders as an A-frame entity with a geometry material and position component set. And here we're driving the color property of our material through the properties on our component. And then down here, my personal favorite, it's a closure script with reagent doing the exact same thing. We're passing in the color here and setting that as the color property on our material component. Interesting note about this, if you ever used FigWheel with Reagent, which does code reloading for you, so basically it will uh, reload your UI without refreshing the browser and losing all the state, that totally works in A-frame. So you can save your code, 
and, and it will just hot reload and your VR scene will be updated instantaneously. And it's cool to see all those technologies kind of work together like that. Oh, sorry. One huge caveat about this. Uh, if you are making more of a traditional game where you might have like a player whose position needs to be updated every single frame, you would not want to drive that through a web UI framework. Because if you're doing that through Angular, you'll have to you know, update your code and your like, TypeScript component, and then that would be, have to be rendered through your template to update the virtual DOM to update the DOM, and then A-Frame would take that DOM change and apply it to the VR scene, and that is a lot of overhead. Um, but if you're making more of an app like what we're going to build, which is user event driven, uh, this is definitely a good choice because it's going to solve a lot of problems that you would have to deal with anyway. Okay, so A-Frame has a ton of components that come out of the box. Uh, there's also a huge uh, library of community provided components as well. Um, but ultimately, you're going to have some custom behavior for your application, and you're going to want to register your own components with A-Frame. So to do that, you just call register component method on the A-Frame object, you pass in the name for your components, and then you pass in a configuration object. Now this configuration object has a number of important things. The first thing is the schema here. Uh, this is defining all the properties that your component requires. So here we're saying our component has one property called my property. We expect it to be a number, and if it's not provided, we'll default it to 1.0. Then there's a bunch of lifecycle events that we can actually define. So uh, here we're defining an init function. This will be called when our component is first added to an entity, so you do any state setup there. The update function is called both immediately after the init and then also any time any of the property values change. So this is where you want to set up and update any state that is associated with your properties. Uh, if you need to run logic on every single frame, you can define a tick function. Um, it's important to avoid this if at all possible because you'll add you can add a lot of overhead to your game if you're running logic on every single frame. So try to make your components event driven if possible. Uh, and then also remember that your component should be able to be added and removed during the lifetime of the entity. So the remove function is called whenever the component is removed and this is where you want to clean up any state you might have created. And that's basically it to make a custom component. Uh, A-Frame also has a similar mechanism for defining custom systems but I'm not going to dive into that just because we won't be doing that for our application. So if we wanted to use our custom component here, we just have an entity, add our my component attribute, and here we're setting the my property value to 2.0 instead of the default 1.0. Okay, so let's dive into our application design. Um, so we're building a VR encyclopedia. Um, we have some very simple requirements. We want our users to be able to view one topic at a time, just be able to read about a single topic, and then we want them to be able to navigate to any related topic to that current topic. Um, it's not important to know for this talk, but I did want to give it a little shout out. Um, I've been building this app on my own time, and to provide the data for the app, I've been using a project called DBpedia, uh, which is a really cool initiative where they scrape data from Wikipedia and then add structure to it and store it in a queryable fact database. And so you can issue all sorts of structured queries against all the different topics in Wikipedia. So I'd highly recommend checking it out because I think it's a really fascinating data set to work with. Okay, so now I want to go through the data that we're going to have for a single topic, and then we'll do a little 2D mock-up of what we're going to build from that data. So in this case, our topic is Boise, Idaho, so we'll have a little title string. Uh, then we'll have a summary string. This will be a few paragraphs of information about the topic. This is basically what the user will be able to read about in our uh, user interface. Uh, and then we'll have a URL to related image. We want to display this image to the user. And then for the related topics, we're going to have them grouped by the type of relationship that they have to the current topic. And we're doing this because we're going to build our UI around the structure. So uh, we might imagine we have a couple of related topics, Idaho and the United States. These would be grouped under the relationship type that is, is city of, because Boise is a city of Idaho and Boise is a city of the United States. You might imagine we'd also have is birthplace of, and then we'd have all the uh, famous people that were born in Boise would be there. Uh, from our, for our UI, um, it's going to be pretty basic. We're going to have the title of our topic at the top. We'll have the little summary paragraph just below that. Uh, we'll have the image floating over to the left. And then for the navigation, we're basically going to show a row of buttons for all of the relationship types. So is city of, is birthplace of. Then if the user selects one of those buttons, we will show another row of buttons for the topics that are under that type of relationship. Uh, so they click on is city of, we'll show a button for Idaho and a button for United States. And then if they select one of those buttons, we'll go and fetch the data for that topic and rebuild our whole UI around that. Okay, so let's get into the implementation. Um, we're going to start with Hello World from A-Frame and then build from there. So this is Hello World in A-Frame. We're making an HTML file. We're including the A-Frame library in our header. And in the body, we're adding an A-Scene element. And the A-Scene is the root element of your application. You should only have one A-Scene for your app. And then we can add as many entities as we need to uh, within that root element. So here we're adding a single entity. 
that has a text component where we're setting the value property of the text to hello world. And this will make it render, that, in, that entity will render as a string hello world in our VR scene. Now up here in the top right, this will be a little preview window of what we're building as we go through it. Um, I've made a few additions to this scene because I think it makes it easier to understand how we're changing things. Um, an interesting point, this is actually, so A-frame will fall back to um, uh, uh, traditional 2D rendering of the scene when there's no VR headset attached. Uh, and this is actually an iframe with an embedded VR application. And that's, that's the days we're in right now. So this is actually a little interaction or a little thing we can run. And in the scene, we, I've added a couple things. I've added these cubes to the scene and then a little ground plane. And that'll just help you understand how I'm moving the camera around and give you a better sense of depth. So when there's not a VR system attached, basically I can use the mouse and the keyboard to kind of walk around the world and look around. But down here on the ground, very tiny, we see Hello World. Uh, it's stuck halfway through the ground because it's right at the origin, but we'll change that in just a moment. But this is A-frame. This is what our little scene is going to look like. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is replace that Hello World string with our um, title of our topic. So I mentioned earlier you can use a UI framework. Um, I'm not going to pick one of those for this talk. Instead, I'm just going to use a very kind of basic templating language that I kind of made up to. Uh, so here we're just taking the title off of our topic object, and we're going to use that and replace the hello world with that string. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, so what we get is this. And now if we look down, we see, whoops, oh, keys. We see hello world, uh, or sorry, we see Boise, Idaho, now stuck in the ground. It's probably impossible to read on the screen. But yeah, it's there. We'll fix that in just a moment. Uh, so I'm also going to get rid of all the surrounding code, because we're not going to edit it at all. We're just going to focus on the entity that we're building. So. Let's reposition the title, and then let's also add a nice little background rectangle to make it stand out. So to do this, we're adding a position component. Uh, we're gonna set the position to three units on the Y axis and negative two units on the Z axis. Um, kind of an interesting thing about this, uh, the coordinates are not just a made up system. These are actually meters, because the WebVR API is serving you the user's position in meters. Um, and, and it's kind of interesting, one quirk of VR is that these are actually real world meters, not just made up meters, basically. So this will feel like it's three meters in the air away from the user and negative two meters in front of the user. Uh, I also forgot to mention that in A-frame, the user is positioned right at the origin of the world. So we're gonna position all of our UI components relative to the center of the world. Uh, then to give it that nice little background, we're going to add a geometry component. Uh, we're gonna set the primitive type to plane. This will just make it render as a flat plane. And then we're gonna set the width to two meters wide and the height to auto. And what this does is the geometry component will resize the height of our geometry to fit the height of the text component that's added to that same entity. So when we do this, we get this. So now we see Boise, Idaho floating up in the air. It's hopefully about two meters away and hopefully three, three meters up in the air. Um, and then it's just a flat plane. So if we walk around behind it, it disappears. There's no back faces. Um, but that's basically it for rendering our title of our application. So the next step is to bring in the summary paragraph for our topic. So to do that, we're going to add, oops, to do that, we're going to add another um, entity. Uh, again, we're going to add a position component. We're gonna set it just 0.2 meters below our title. And then we're going to add a text component. And this time we're gonna set a width on the text component. And we're doing this, what this does is basically the text component will do word wrapping when our words start getting further than two meters wide. Uh, and then we're going to um, set our value to the summary from our topic. So the reason we're doing the word wrapping is because if we did not do this, our string would just go on forever into the distance and there'd be no way for the user to read it. This, in this case, it'll keep it kind of nice and in front of the user. So what this looks like is this. So now we see Boise, Idaho. We see our summary string there below it that we can read and it's being wrapped um, in two meters so we can see that's about the width of our title, which we set to two meters as well. Uh, and again, this is just flat text. If we walk around behind it, it disappears, everything else. Okay. so. Uh, we always basically want our summary paragraph to be positioned just below the title. Um, so what we're going to do is actually group these under a parent entity and then change their positions so that they're relative to one another. So we're gonna wrap them, oops. So we're going to wrap them in a parent entity. We're going to take the position that was originally on that title, we're gonna move it to the parent entity's position, and then we're gonna zero out the position on that title. And then we'll change the position of our summary paragraph to just be 0.2 meters below the title. And this way, we'll kind of, we can move these two together as one unit just by changing the position of that parent entity. The only reason I'm pointing this out is that um, when you're usually doing VR development, you're usually on your monitor and you're kind of guessing at coordinates, and then you put the headset on and you realize these are all incorrectly positioned. You need to, like, they're too far away to read or whatever else. 
So you have to go back in and fix this. And the fewer things, the fewer places you have to make changes, the better, because you want that feedback cycle to be a lot faster. So that's why we're grouping these things. So the next thing we need to do is add a title or add our image. So to add the image, we're going to add another entity. Uh, we're going to position it one unit left on the x-axis. So this is this position at one meter to the left of our uh, title. Uh, then to render an image in A-frame, we're basically going to add a geometry component set to the plane primitive. So again, just a flat square. Uh, then to get the image from our URL and apply it to that uh, geometry, all we have to do is add a material component, set the source property to the URL of that image URL string from our topic. And behind the scenes, A-frame and 3JS is doing everything necessary to go and fetch the image from that URL, download it, convert it to a texture, and apply that texture to this geometry. So that's pretty good in terms of uh, lines of code. Uh, what this ends up looking like is this. Oops. So there we go. Now I see uh, a little skyline of Boise. Um, but notice there's an issue here, and the issue is that our buildings are not that tall and skinny. Uh, the aspect ratio of our image is actually much wider than it is tall. And the reason it's doing this is that our geometry component, by default, is one meter wide and one meter tall. So it's always going to render as a square. What we'd like to do is adjust our geometry to fit the actual aspect ratio of that image. And to do this, we're going to leave the width intact, and then we will change the height of our geometry to accommodate for that image aspect ratio. Also important to note, we're not going to know the aspect ratio of the image ahead of time, so we're going to have to do it on the fly. And to do this, we're going to make our own custom component. So now we're in JavaScript land. Um, this is a very common problem, and there's already a community-provided component that does this exact thing. I think it's called fit texture. Um, but we're going to define our own just because it's kind of a nice, concise example of how you might need to make your own component. Uh, so we're going to call ours resize image. For our configuration object, we're going to first set some dependencies. So our component does not make sense unless it's added to an entity that also has a geometry and a material because we're going to be responding to the texture that the material downloads and update the geometry's dimensions based on that image aspect ratio. So when we add this dependencies uh, to, the, to our component, I think A-Frame will basically uh, add those components if they're not already on the same entity. So for our schema, which again is the properties that our component requires, we're gonna leave this blank. That's because our um, component does not require any configuration. It will just work out of the box. Uh, now for our init function. Again, this is called when our component is first added to an entity. We're gonna do a few things here. Um, we're gonna start with storing away a reference to this on texture loaded function that we're going to define in just a moment. And the next thing we want to do is actually bind that, that our, um, uh, add this as an event listener, call this on texture loaded function when this event occurs. So this event is published by the material component whenever the texture has been downloaded and is ready. So um, that's where we can get the actual aspect ratio of the image and then update our geometry component. So we're calling add event listener on the this.l field. The L um, represents the A entity DOM element that our component was added to, and that's how we get access to the entity that our component belongs on. Um, this is also a very common pattern um, to keep components decoupled, where basically components will emit events on the um, actual uh, DOM element, and then we can bind our own listeners as we need to to those. So this is how uh, components can kind of stay decoupled. Okay, so let's define our on texture loaded function. Um, the first thing we want to do is get, an access, get access to the current image properties. So we can access, access that at this path here. So this event is provided by the material component. We can access the image properties here. Uh, now we can want to calculate the aspect ratio of the image. We're just going to take the height of the image divided by the width. Now what we need to do is get the current width of our geometry so that we can calculate the desired height. So to get the properties of another component on the same element, we can just call get attribute on the A entity DOM element, pass in the name of the component that we care about, and this will return a map of properties to their values. So now we can calculate our, I'm sorry, let me scroll down here. Now we can calculate our um, height by taking the current geometry width multiplying by our aspect ratio. And now what we want to do is apply that height to our geometry to update its height. To do that, we just call the set attribute method on the DOM element, pass in the name of the component that we want to change, and then pass in a map of the properties to the values that we want to uh, update. So here we're just updating the height property of our geometry to the height that we just calculated. And that's basically it. Um, but we need to also clean up any state we might have created when our component is removed. So all we need to do is remove the event listener that we originally added up earlier. Uh, and that's, that's basically it, that's our entire component. So to use this component, um, we just add that resize image attribute to our entity. And we should get something, hopefully this works. Okay. Now we see that our image has the correct aspect ratio. 
Uh, it's really tiny, but that's okay. Um, so it's still one meter wide, but now it's, uh, uh, the height was um, shrunk to make it fit that aspect ratio. Okay, so that is basically our, um, the primary portion of our application. We can read about the topic, we can see the title, we can see the image. Now we want to add those navigation buttons. So to do that, we're going to be using a third party component um, called layout. And what this does is it arranges the child entities in some arrangement that we define. So we want all of our buttons in a nice little row in front of the user, so we're going to set the type of the layout to line, and then we're going to add um, child entities to this parent entity, uh, and each child entity will basically just be a button. So we're going to loop over uh, all of the relationship types in that topic.related map, uh, and then to make a button, we're just gonna make an entity that has a text component where we're rendering the relationship type, so this will be is city of or is birthplace of, uh, then we're gonna add a geometry component to give it that little background rectangle to make it look like a button. So we're gonna set the primitive to plane, and then the width to 1.0, just one meter wide, and the height to auto, again, to fit the height of the text. And then we're gonna add an on-click, and this will be the logic that we're gonna call whenever this button is actually clicked. All we're going to do is store away the type of that button into the selected type property or variable. Okay, so what this ends up looking like, do, 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 do. there we go. So now we see some buttons in front of the user arranged in a line. We see is city of and is birthplace of. And again, these are just flat buttons, um, kind of a little bit closer to the user than our topic data. Uh, now what we want to do is actually make them interactable. So if we click on them right now, nothing's going to happen. But what we want to do is show a row of buttons uh, uh, for the topics that are fall under that relationship type. So to do that, uh, to do that, we just need to add another um, line parent entity because we want to arrange these in a row again. And then we're going to loop over all of the related topics in that um, topic.related map for the currently selected type that we assigned up here. And again, we're just going to make a button for those. We're going to add the text component, geometry component. And this time for the on click, we're going to call some made up load topic function. And this would go and fetch the data for that topic from that URL, and then we'd rebuild our UI around that topic. We're actually not going to implement that just because that's a lot of time. Uh, now, if we stopped here, um, the problem would be that the user cannot actually click on these entities, because in VR, you don't have a mouse. Um, so we're going to commit uh, one of the cardinal sins of VR app development, and we're going to add laser pointer controls to our game. To do that, A-Frame has a built-in component called laser controls and uh, a ray caster component. So when we add these to an entity in our scene, it turns your VR controllers into laser pointers. And then when we add the raycaster component, this makes that laser pointer actually do raycast checks into the scene to see if any entity uh, is being pointed at. And then if the user pulls the trigger on their controller, it will invoke the click method, or the on-click event, on our entities that they're pointing at. Um, the reason this is the cardinal sin is that it's basically the easiest and laziest way to get um, interactivity in a VR game, <laughs> or to emulate what it's like to use a mouse. Uh, so what we end up with is this. Uh, where I can now look at the is city of button. I can, oh, oh, sometimes it doesn't work. It's okay, there we go. So now we see Idaho and the United States show up, but if we click on his birthplace of, come on, come on. Yeah, sometimes it doesn't work. <laughs> but you see, oh, there we go. So uh, now we see Alice and Bob show up uh, under there. Uh, and then the idea would be if I click on one of these, we go and refresh the page for that thing, but we're not gonna do that because we're running out of time. Uh, so that is, oops. There we go. That is basically our entire application. Um, again, I, I hand-waved some of that stuff, but that's fine. Uh, some next steps here. First of all, performance is going to be awful, even for this simplistic application, when you're going to like the standalone Oculus Go headset. Uh, I can tell you from experience, I did this exact implementation, and I got about 25 frames per second. We're shooting for 60 on the Oculus Go, at least. Um, and the issue here is that our text component, it renders every single character as an individual quad. So um, basically that's a lot of quads that you don't need when we have really long summary paragraphs. So the fix for this would be to first render that text to a texture and then have one quad that is rendering all of the text for the summary. Uh, and that's definitely possible. Uh, then uh, for the UI, there's a lot of UI issues that we have not thought about here. Um, the first thing is supporting more text. So if you have a very long summary paragraph, basically what will happen now in our app is it'll just disappear into the ground and there's no way for the user to read that. So we might wanna add like a paging for the text or maybe a, a scroll where they can grab it and scroll up. Um, and then for our related topics, if you have a lot of related topics, those buttons are just gonna disappear off into space. Um, we might wanna wrap them around the user or make a, a, a little more fancy uh, uh, control for that. 
And then finally, the interactions. They're really, uh, we just did the laser pointer, which again is kind of lazy. Um, we should make it more fun and more VR-like where you can actually like reach out and press the button with your controller or maybe use voice control to search for things so you can't really search for a topic right now in our application. And then finally, actually make use of VR. So there is no way that our application is better than just wait, reading a Wikipedia article on your monitor. <laughs> so it's just horrible. Um, but let's, let's have some fun with it and like maybe add um, scenery to the scene when you're looking at certain topics or play audio. If you're reading about like a composer, just play audio or do something, things like that. Um, so there's definitely a lot of places you could take this application going forward. And that's basically it. Uh, you guys have any questions? <laughs> I'll never, I'll never get tired of that. <laughs> Those dinosaur costumes are hilarious. Yes? So we're talking about performance. Can you use like a YouTube response with Uh Yeah, so the question was, uh, um, could you, uh, with performance, could you make a, a Beat Saber clone in A-Frame? And I would bet so. You probably uh, would struggle getting it working on like a standalone VR platform. I think you could, you could probably do it, but uh, um, if you're definitely on a PC VR system, it'd be, it'd be super fast. I don't think you'd have any issue with that. Um, and I think there might be someone who's tried that already. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a great uh, way to do it. Th this, is, this is Beat Saber, by the way, which is a really popular VR game. Uh, yes? Um, so, oh, sorry, the question was, is all the styling you do, does it have to be with textures, or does, is there any CSS support? Um, the answer is that you can, so for instance, for the, the text rendering all that text to one texture, uh, the way that's actually done is you can render, um, you can actually render like a DOM tree to a texture. So you could do CSS styling to like lay out your text or whatever else and convert it to a texture and then apply that to an image. Uh, that is a lot of overhead, so you want to do that once and then cache it and store it away. Um, but that would be possible. But otherwise, yeah, there's no, you can't do any CSS styling through it. Um, good question. So the question was, uh, does A-Frame offer any AR support or is it just VR? I think at the moment it is just VR, um, but that web, VA, web VR API that we were talking about earlier, this, I, that's actually the 1.0 version. They're already like going through the second version, which is going to be called WebXR, and it's supposed to support both AR and VR applications going forward, but I don't know if A-Frame will support that necessarily. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, behind. Yeah. Um, I would probably lean toward, oh sorry, the question was how would you implement uh, text searching uh, in VR? So uh, that's a common problem, text entry right now. There's not a good way to do keyboards. Um, most VR like um, systems, like Steam VR provides a virtual keyboard that you can use laser pointers to point at keys and press them. Um, I would recommend probably voice control for that, just like have it, have it say out loud what you want to search for and then go and search. It's probably the most convenient thing in VR because most um, headsets include a microphone built into them. Yeah, Craig? Yeah. Browsers generally don't have access to hardware plugins with the or How does A-Frame know that you're pointing at a VR headset? So uh, the question was, how does A-Frame know that your uh, that your or your browser has an attached VR device, basically? Um, so that's what the Web VR API is providing you. Um, there's some functions in there. I actually removed them from these slides, but the the primary function is get VR displays, and that's on the navigator object in your browser. Um, and that will enumerate all the attached VR systems. And then you pick one of those and say, I want to start rendering to that. And what you actually do is you still use WebGL to render to a canvas element. If you've ever done 3D rendering on, on the web, you're still doing that. Uh, and you're still rendering to a canvas. You actually provide that canvas element to the um, request present function, I think, on the VR display. And then you just do your rendering to that canvas. You render for the left eye to the left half of the frame, right eye to the right half of the frame. And then you take that image and just push it to the VR display, basically. But it's the WebVR API that is providing you access to those things. Any other questions? Yeah. You kind of just do export the like, web form, right? And, and could you do like VR development and then export to the web? And would that be easier, more performant than A frame? Or have you had any experience with that? So the question was uh, because Unity can export to uh, um, like WebGL. Uh, can you do the same thing with WebVR, basically? Uh, I cannot, I'm not sure. I have not tried that personally. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if that's one of the targets, but it's hard to say at this point. Um, also, I forgot to mention that WebVR, one of the kind of issues with it right now is that the hardware support is kind of fractured. So like the Microsoft Edge browser supports those Windows Mixed Reality headsets, and then Chrome for Android only supports the Google Daydream. So it's like you only get certain support across headsets. 
Um, probably Firefox right now is the one that supports the most because it actually supports Steam VR. So if you have a Steam VR compatible headset, it will work on Firefox. Any other questions? Yes, in back. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so the question was, uh, you're doing, when you're do, doing development, you're usually going between your monitor and your headset, and is there any way to do all that development just through a headset, effectively? Um, there have definitely been some like, experiments to do that, where the rendering, like, I think there's a JavaScript, or maybe an, even an A-frame one, where you can like, see your screen, and if you, if you can get your hands on your keyboard and make sure they're staying there, then you can actually type around. Um, the, I think the primary thing that's limiting that right now is the resolution of the displays, where it's still not very comfortable you, to read a lot of text in VR. And especially if you're looking at an IDE, it's going to be pretty limited. Um, that being said, uh, you can, like, the Oculus runtime does allow you to basically attach windows, overlay, like, normal Windows applications in your VR scene. They'll just kind of always sit next to you. Um, and you could maybe bring up Visual Studio Code and then like look up like, and see being in your app and maybe change it from there and see the app update. Um, at the moment, I don't think that's been figured out that well at this point. Any other questions? Well, great, thank you very much.